Hey guys, Ryan here. The Halloween season is right around the corner, but don't worry, I'm working on some new stuff for the spooky season this year. But in the meantime, I thought I would put together a collection of all of my horror filmmaking videos that I've made over the entire life of this channel. The following is an over two hour compilation of every video I've made on the horror filmmaking topic, ranging from horror filmmaking techniques, creating suspense, and even creating your own fake blood to use in your films. Over the course of the video, you'll probably see me gain weight, lose weight, and gain weight again, and you might even see my hair grow back a little bit. Some of these videos go all the way back to when the channel was still called the Piedmont Motion Picture Show, which some of you may remember. So I hope you guys are excited. Grab some popcorn, turn down the lights, and let's settle in for two hours of horror filmmaking goodness. And I'll see you guys back here when it's all said and done. Hey guys, Ryan here. Today we're talking about my newest short film, Trophies and everything that went into making it. Now there's going to be huge spoilers for Trophies in this video. So if you haven't seen the film yet, please go watch Trophies first and then come back and check this video out. Be sure to stick around until the end of this video cause I'm going to be going over questions that you guys posted in regards to the film after it was released. Trophies is a short horror thriller mystery that I've been planning for a while now. And the idea for it actually came from, if you remember a while back, I posted a, a location scouting video about a bridge here near the area where I live. After going and filming that bridge on a really rainy kind of uh, overcast day, uh, ideas for stories started coming through my head. I really wanted to figure out something that I could shoot at that location that would highlight the location and let me use it and also tell a great story. At the same time, I've been wanting to create some sort of detective thriller mystery story for a while and turn it into a feature film. And I thought that I would use this opportunity to put together a proof of concept for a potential feature film that I could make in the future. And that was how this story came about. I didn't want to do the traditional, you know, detectives hunting down a serial killer thing. I wanted to kind of twist the idea around on its head and spoilers have the detective actually be the villain in the story. Now, if this were going to be turned into a full feature film, you wouldn't know that fact until maybe the end of the story uh, while, you know, two detectives and were hunting the killer and their partner ended up being the uh, killer in the end, something along those lines, but you get the idea. So anyway, I started putting together this story in my head loosely. Nothing was down on paper yet for a story about a evil detective and a abuse of power was the theme of the story. And I started thinking about ways I could use that location. And one day I just woke up and the weather was perfect. Storm clouds in the air, the wind was blowing. And I told my wife, I was like, I need to get outside and shoot something today. And in that respect, this film actually feels kind of like a spiritual successor to one of the very first short films I posted here on the channel, which is still one of the most popular somehow, uh, The Farmhouse. Uh, the morning I woke up and started shooting The Farmhouse, I had no intentions of making a short film out of it. Uh, many of you may know this story already. I woke up and the weather was just absolutely perfect. And I was like, I need to go film that farmhouse today because it looks so cool. And that's really how this short film came to be too. But this time I actually had a story in mind for something I could do. So I just drove out to the location, set my camera up and started filming some shots of me walking around the area. And as I did that, the story kind of came together. I never wrote a script for this short film. I did a few storyboards just to get my ideas collected uh, of how he was digging through the dirt and looking for the ring and all that kind of stuff. The most challenging aspect of making this short film was the weather. I wasn't able to film everything in one day which was really disappointing to me. And the first day that I started filming this, the weather was just absolutely perfect. And the next week I kind of, there was a kind of another day where it was kind of cloudy, but not really rainy or, you know, there was a little bit of sunlight coming through. And I filmed quite a few scenes that day when I got home with the footage, nothing matched up. I couldn't get anything to look the same. Uh, just that little sliver of sunlight in the air completely changed 
the look of the film. So that was a big challenge. And right after I finished, um, you know, painstakingly over the course of a couple of weeks, looking for those perfect weather days, after I actually finished filming everything, we had a whole week where the weather was exactly what I needed the entire week. Uh, so yeah, after all that, um, you know, anxiety and stress, freaking out about being able to get perfect weather days, we had an entire week where the weather was perfect. Uh, go figure, you know. But let's go ahead and walk through this film and I'll kind of talk about everything piece by piece. The first thing you may notice watching this is I've created a new production company name called Ritual Myth Entertainment. Uh, there's going to be more to come on that in the future. I'm actually working on some really exciting things with my friend Courtney Jones, which kind of led to this, but I can't really talk about it yet. So hopefully I can tell you guys more about that business endeavor in the coming months uh, next year, hopefully sometime. Now, as I said, the theme of this film is abuse of power. And uh, I found some really great quotes about abuse of power. And I thought this one really fit the story really well and you know, match the theme I was going for. Uh, I just feel like there's absolutely nothing scarier than uh, someone in a position of power that is in a position where they can abuse that power and control others or take advantage of others. And I think a detective being uh, an evil person like this is really, really scary. They can almost do whatever they want and maybe even get away with it if they're smart enough which is a really scary thing to think about. Now, the first voice you will hear is me. I am playing the part of Detective Paul Parker, the serial killer. And the second voice you'll hear is a voice actor named E.D. Luke. I found him on Fiverr uh, and I paid him for his services and he provided a great voiceover for the role of the captain who is speaking to his detective about returning to the crime scene and seeing if there's anything they missed. I saw a few people were kind of confused about this aspect. I'll go into questions at the end of this video, um, but yeah. Maybe a little confusing to some people that, you know, the detective is going back out to a site. This uh, title shot here over overlooking the cornfield was one of the first shots I filmed. I was actually on the way to the bridge location and I saw this cornfield on the side of the road with the wind gently blowing through it. And I just had to stop and get a sh establishing shot here. And I thought this worked really great for an opening shot. So moody. Uh, mood is such an important part of this short film and just any film in general, in my opinion. Sometimes mood is more important to me than story. I know that might be blasphemy to some people, but I really love establishing a mood and a sense of time and place and weather. And I, this shot really just conveys all of that uh, with the simple blowing of the breeze and a look at the clouds and the landscape. I just thought it looked great and it's a beautiful shot. I really, I'm really proud of this shot. And here we have some additional establishing shots. The, um, the dialogue is all taking place off camera. I thought that was really important. I didn't want to have uh, the main character show his face at all. So I thought it was important that I have the dialogue happening off camera for the most part. And here are some more establishing shots of the bridge area and the location that our character is going to be investigating. This establishing more mood and location. I filmed this entire thing almost completely by myself as far as camera work goes. Uh, every shot you see, I would set, set the camera up, find my focus, white balance, all that good stuff and I would add in motion in post-production. All the motion, all the camera motion you see, if I'm not holding the camera, is motion that I added in post-production so it's not real. And I think it's a great way to make it look like you have someone operating the camera if you are filming by yourself. Now here we have the very first uh, sign that something might not be exactly right with this detective character. He kind of sounds like the captain is getting on his nerves and uh, if you don't know the whole story, you could just chalk that up to him not liking to obey authority or maybe him and the captain have had some sort of bad history where they don't get along. You know, a lot of times in detective movies, detectives and captains bump, you know, bump heads and they, they, they disagree on a lot of different things. So that was kind of my intention here was to give a little taste that something isn't right with this detective's frame of mind, but also it could be explained away in a very natural and, you know, uh, conceivable way that he is just uh, not good at taking orders from this particular captain. And here we have a shot where you see uh, our missing person that it's, the detective is searching for. 
Um, you see her name is Olivia Braddock. This is actually my oldest daughter's senior picture that I used to create this missing person flyer. And if you look closely at the bottom, you'll see that the case name is The Ring Bearer. That's kind of an Easter egg that you might miss. This film was actually called The Ring Bearer early on, but I decided to change it to a one word name because I just like the way that sounded. And I changed it to Trophies, which I feel like is a much more fitting name for the film. Here we have a great shot of the detective getting out of the car and approaching the bridge area. I was kind of torn on some of these scenes. Uh, I didn't want to have too much of him just walking around and I actually cut out quite a bit. There's a constant struggle with me and I guess many filmmakers where I get these really great looking shots of just like mundane things happening, like the detective walking around the crime scene. You only need so much of that. If it's not propelling the story forward, it's usually best to cut that out with a short film. And I struggle with that in this film as well. I ended up keeping a few scenes that I actually removed and then put back in of him just walking across the bridge and stuff like that. And like I said, there's that constant struggle of, you know, shots looking really good and you want to use them, but you have to ask yourself, does it move the story forward? And I thought in this case, I could use it because I wanted to show that he was walking deep into the woods. And I thought that was my you know, motivation for using those shots in the film. Almost all of the sound effects you hear in this film, including the gravel footsteps and the door shutting on the car, all of that was provided by Epidemic Sound. I use Epidemic Sound for all of my short films. Uh, all of the sound work, all of the music you hear in here is all from Epidemic Sound. It's a great service, great search functionality to find just about anything that you're looking for. And if you follow the link in the description below, you can get a free trial. So be sure to check that out and tell them that Ryan sent you. Now, one thing that I was kind of disappointed about while shooting this was I had a flashlight on me at the time of filming these scenes. And for some reason, the flashlight beam just didn't show up on camera. I don't know why, kind of a missed opportunity. I thought there was some great spots where it would be great to see the, you know, the light from the flashlight searching the area, but it just didn't show up on camera for some reason. If I could go back, I would probably use some uh, haze in the scenes to give the woods a little bit more depth and creepiness. Uh, but, you know, I was shooting guerrilla style, didn't have much time to plan things out as people uh, were constantly coming in and out of this location and blocking my shots. So I had to film really quick. I didn't use any lighting. Everything you see is natural lighting. And, you know, I just used minimal gear, my camera, myself, and that was pretty much it. Now, here we have a scene where the detective is startled where some birds are breaking a tree branch in the distance and fluttering away. I wanted to add this scene in just to make the audience get a little bit more closer to this detective character. That way I could pull the rug out from under them later. Uh, when you know you see him being startled and scared, it kind of makes you think that he's not the bad guy. So it was a red herring on my part to steer the audience in one direction with some information that this guy is kind of nervous being out here in this area and he's not comfortable and the audience should feel for him and relate to his uncomfortableness. So that was my intention on adding this scene. The shot where he dips under the crime scene tape was really important. I wanted to establish that there was in fact a crime scene here. Uh, in my mind, uh, the police knew that a crime had occurred here, uh, whether they found an article of clothing or they found blood, but they never found a body. That was my intention. Uh, I've had some people ask about that. They never found the body and that's why he's back out here to go over the area one more time and see if there was anything that they may have missed. But now that we know that he is the killer, he's returning because this guy gets off on manipulating the police. He gets off on working under the shadows uh, on both sides of the law. And he's going back to claim his trophy, which is what he wanted to do. He could have took it when he killed her, but he gets off on the fact that this body is here, no one found it, and he's going to go and claim his trophy and then pin the crime on someone else, which we'll see soon. Now here we see an X that he has marked into a tree. Um, the intention here was the audience doesn't quite know yet what's going on, but this is a marker that he left on a tree so that he could find his way back to the body more easily. In the audience's mind, I would think that, you know, he noticed this scratch into the tree and he's following it as some sort of clue to help him figure out what exactly is going on here. 
Now, once we see him tracing his steps, things start to get a little confusing to our audience. Things start feeling a little off. Why is he doing this? This is just something that we have to come to a conclusion on watching this. And I thought this was really fun to manipulate the audience like this. They're like, what the hell is going on here? He's looking for clues, but yet he seems like he knows a little more than we know. So that's where the confusion starts to set in. Here you'll see our first look at his detective badge. This was a uh, toy prop that I ordered off of Amazon.com. All in all, I spent about $50 on this short film buying rubber gloves, the, the prop um, uh, badge. I also was wearing a prop gun on my hip, but you can't really see it in the film. And I really didn't think there was any reason for me to uh, pull that out or show it in any way in the film. So it's there, but you can't really tell it's there. And I also spent money on hiring my voice actor on Fiverr. So that was pretty much the entirety of the money I spent making this film. Everything else was equipment or gear I had beforehand. Here we see him putting on his latex gloves. This was a shot that I had in mind since I started thinking about this film. I really wanted to see a detective standing over a crime scene and putting on his latex gloves. There's just something you know iconic about that. Uh, here the audience should still be kind of confused. Uh, what does he know that we don't know? Why is he going to search this particular area? Why did he know how many steps he should take to get to this area? All of that is starting to unravel as the audience is watching here. Here we have the digging scene. This is pretty much the climax of the film as he's frantically digging in the dirt. The shot was actually a lot of fun to put together. It's actually the same uh, two shots repeated over and over again and just sped up and sped up and sped up uh, with the sound effects uh, mingling in there to give it more, um, you know, ferociousness. For this shot, I actually had my oldest daughter, who was the one pictured in the missing person poster from earlier. I used some makeup I had to make her hand look old and pale and dead and decayed. I had her lay down in the woods. I put the ring on her finger, of course, which I borrowed from my wife. And then I just dumped an entire bag of uh, potting soil on top of her arm, covered it with leaves, set the camera up and then slowly dug through the dirt until I got the hand exposed and that's how I got that shot. I thought it turned out really well. She looks dead. I really think the sound effects and music go a really long way here in creating that sense of unease and you know that crescendo as the hand is unearthed. It really helps impact, uh, bring forth the impact of you know seeing this dead body in the woods. And I really love how I really didn't show any blood or any gore or anything like that, but you still just get this gross feeling when you're watching this, that there's this dead body under the earth here and we're just seeing just a glimpse of it. But it's just enough to make us feel uneasy and grossed out, which was my intention. Now here we have the scene where he pulls the pill bottle out of his jacket and removes a piece of fiber with some tweezers. This is all stuff that I had lying around the house, a pill bottle, empty pill bottle. I got a red fiber from a sweater I owned and I had some tweezers. This is actually a really difficult shot for me to pull off. I still didn't quite get the fiber in focus the way I wanted to. It was so dark out there. I'm filming by myself. It was really hard to tell if I had that little fiber in focus and hopefully it looks good enough for the film, but it really wasn't up to par with what I wanted to achieve, but it works in the end and I ended up having to use the best shot that I got. So here he is pulling a piece of fiber out that he is no doubt uh, stolen from some sort of evidence locker or from someone that he knows. Um, yeah, I just leave it up to your imagination. Where did he get this piece of fiber? Is it from evidence from another crime, someone that they may have thought committed this crime? Either way, he is planting evidence at this crime scene to incriminate someone else and pull eyes away from himself onto someone else. So there you go. Now here we have the detective frantically walking back, well, not frantically, but quickly walking back to his car. Uh, he looks over his shoulder. Now the audience is starting to, you know, now the audience should have an idea that something is wrong here. Uh, he's planted evidence at a crime scene. Um, he's removed evidence from the crime scene in the way of the ring. And he's looking very suspicious. 
So we pretty much know he is the killer at this point, but I wanted to go a little bit further and just really bring it home with him actually showing his collection of trophies and show how many women he has in fact murdered and stolen their rings. Some of you uh, tech savvy guys might notice that this case that he's pulling out and putting these rings in is in fact an SD card holder case. Um, it's one of the ones that floats, it's waterproof or whatever, but it's a case for holding SD cards. I just put a little bit of gaff tape in each uh, section of the card holder and I just taped the rings to it because they wouldn't stay in place. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Could I have come up with a better solution with this given more time? Probably, but this works. And it also kind of makes sense. Uh, you would want to hide stuff like this somewhere where no one's probably going to look. Why would anyone look for rings in an SD card holder case? And this is going to fit in his pocket really nicely and he can keep it on him at all times and no one's going to find it. I like in this shot how we get one more look at the picture of Olivia Braddock in the background. Uh, he has murdered this girl. It's evident at this point. Uh, it's really sad to see her picture there. And um, no one is going to be able to figure out who did this because the one who did it is the one investigating the crime. I really wanted to have the music crescendo and then just stop abruptly once he gets this ring in this holder and closes it. It's almost like he's closing the book. Um, all the anticipation is over. We know what's happening. We know there's no hope in this story. And pretty much when that music stops, that's when all the hope of the audience of, you know, anyone figuring out uh, what happened to this girl and, you know, bringing some closure to her story is he's closing the book on that effectively. And here we have the very final shot of the film. This was a really tough shot to pull off. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, getting uh, the mirror in focus, getting the camera out of the way of the mirror, uh, by myself figuring out, how, figuring out how to move the mirror in a way that I wanted to where I didn't see much of my face and I was, you know, keeping my hand in focus that was in the shot as well and moving the, the mirror just enough to where you could see my mouth and the little grin that comes over it at the end. Uh, it was also important for me to not show the main character's face in this film. I wanted it to feel mysterious and leave you wondering who this man really is and what he's up to. And you know, this final shot of him grinning into the mirror really just hammers home the fact that he's an evil person and uh, he's playing the game just the way he wants to play it and everyone is falling for his tricks. So that's pretty much the film, guys. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, now let's look at some questions that you guys posted on the in the comments section and on Twitter and stuff, and I'll see if I can answer those questions to the best of my ability. Okay, the first question I have here is from Nacho Molina. He says, Bravo, Ryan, lovely shots, intense, and with the unexpected in, I really love what you do. Thank you so much. What gear did you use? I shot this film on my Panasonic GH5. Um, for audio, I just used a Rode a, a VideoMic uh, Pro attached to the top of the camera, and like I said, I replaced most of the sound effects in this film. Uh, as far as editing, I used Adobe Premiere Pro on my PC to edit the film. Um, that's pretty much it. I didn't use any lights. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I just used a tripod, my camera, and a mounted mic on the camera. Panasonic Lumix GH5 with a Sigma Art 18 to 35 millimeter lens on there. And that was pretty much it. Thank you for the question. Here is an in-depth question about the story from Randy Romero. Hey Ryan, can you clarify something for me? Why would the cops put up crime scene tape if they hadn't discovered a crime or a body? Then the killer cop crosses that same crime scene tape, digs up the hand and retrieves the ring as a trophy, but wouldn't he have done that beforehand? I kind of answered this question earlier. Uh, the reason there was crime scene tape, the cops uh, knew something had happened in this location. Maybe this was where the girl was abducted. Uh, maybe this was where she was last seen. So they, they were searching the area. Maybe they found an article of clothing, but they never found her body here or evidence that her body was here. So he's returning to the scene to see if there's anything they missed. And this is what he revels in um, going back to the scene of a crime this is his you know mo he goes back to the scene of the crime and digs up the body so he could retrieve the trophy that's what he got off on the most was manipulating the police and being one step ahead and smarter than the police this question is from colson studios 
Was this shot by yourself? If so, what was your process? Love your work, thank you so much. Um, this was shot by myself, as I mentioned earlier. Every scene I shot up the tripod, got focused by myself and filmed myself in the shot. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done. Hopefully this is proof of that. Uh, and like I said, I used post-production movement, uh, fake camera movement to make it look as if someone was filming me in most of the shots so that I, you know, if I wasn't actually holding the camera. Uh, and hopefully I went over my process pretty good in there. But if you have any other questions about, you know, how that's done, I actually have quite a few videos here on the channel about how to make a film all by yourself, which goes over some of the best tips and practices for pulling off shots like this. If you're interested in learning more about that. Thank you so much for the question. This question is from Twitter. This is from Adam Alexander. What equipment did you use? Camera and lenses. I used the Panasonic GH5 with my Sigma Art 18 to 35 lens. Uh, the woman's hand looked real. Was it? How did you shoot that? I love the speed ramp of him digging. Did you film that at 24 FPS and then just speed ramp? Uh, yeah, I just filmed that at 24 FPS and then I just sped it up uh, as I needed throughout the course of the shots. And like I said, I reused the shots over and over again. And yes, the woman's hand was real. That was my oldest daughter. Uh, her hand, I you know used makeup to make her look old and dead. And then I just covered it in dirt and then dug through the dirt to find her hand underneath the dirt. And that was pretty much it. And I think that's pretty much all the questions. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for supporting my work and trophies. Have some big news coming in the year ahead. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you for taking time out to uh, listen to me rant and ramble about what went into making this thing. I hope this has been beneficial for you and you learned something. And of course, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to post them in the comments below. I'll be happy to continue answering questions about this film and what went into it. All in all, I'm really proud of this film. I think it's one of the best things I've done here for the channel. Uh, I thought the look turned out great. The pacing was great. Um, you know, just really proud of it and I hope you guys liked it. Please, if you did, please let me know in the comments below on the actual film itself, what you thought if you haven't already. And hopefully I will see you again on the next video. Bye-bye. On this video, we'll talk about the various ways we can create better scares, and in the second half of the video, I'll detail the different types of scares often found in the horror thriller genre. Before that, let's talk about this video's sponsor, Epidemic Sound. Epidemic Sound is the best place for royalty-free music and sound effects for your film and video projects. I use a ton of sound effects when I'm creating a short film, and the library of sound effects and the spot-on search functionality featured on Epidemic Sound is hands down the best I've ever used. And the music selection is pretty impressive too. Sound design is such an important part of the filmmaking process, and having access to the Epidemic Sound library is going to help take your projects to the next level. Use the link in the description below to sign up for a free 30-day trial to Epidemic Sound to experience the difference for yourself and help support the channel in the process. Now, back to the video. Scares and suspense go hand in hand, and learning how to create suspense within our films can help deliver even more impactful scares. I'd highly recommend watching my deep dive on how to create suspense in film. The video link will be in the description below. But the short of it is that creating suspense is all about how you deliver or withhold information from your audience. Learning how to hold the audience in the palm of your hand with the use of information can create suspense and anticipation for the scares to come. Let's look at ways we can build suspense, create unease, mood, and anticipation within our films, and thus create more effective scares. Music and sound, or the absence of either, can go a very long way in helping you lay the groundwork and set the mood for your scares. It can also help when delivering the actual scare itself, with screeching musical cues or wailing operatic moans that can create a sense of dread. And sometimes the absence of music and letting the quiet set in can help deliver an even greater punch when the scare lets itself be known. Try experimenting with sound during your edit to see what fits best and what creates the best sensation of dread and terror. 
The type of music used in a scene can greatly change the audience's feeling about what they are seeing happen on the screen. Use music and sound to control their emotions the way that you see fit. Another way that we can manipulate our audience is to use camera angles and framing that defies the norm and makes them feel mentally uncomfortable. Tilting our camera to left or right, using extreme close-ups, or using a dolly zoom effect made popular in Jaws will make our audience feel uneasy or confused. Using uncommon angles and shots like this helps sell the idea that the characters in our films are experiencing something out of the ordinary or they themselves are losing touch with reality. Long takes are a great way to lull our audience into a sense of unease or foreboding and then scaring them when they either think that the threat has passed or dragging on for so long they are antsy with anticipation. Scenes like the bike riding scene from The Shining serve to lull the audience into a sense of complacency or mesmerize them and even put their nerves on edge with this stillness and quietness as our character is followed by the camera. These types of scenes work most effectively when our audience is aware of the danger but aren't quite sure as to where and when the danger will actually come forward. Ambiguity is an aspect of storytelling that I am exceptionally fond of, and using it could go a long way into making our viewers question reality and let their minds wonder as they try to fill in the gaps with their own imagination. Leaving some things unanswered, I think, can make our films more interesting on the whole, as it allows our viewers to question the true meaning of things and to think about our films for much longer after they finished watching them. Ambiguity can help us achieve a scary mood in our films by creating a sense of unknown, and fear of the unknown is very powerful. One of the most primal fears and aspects of life is the unknown of what awaits us in death. Using fear of the unknown to fuel the scares in our films can be a very powerful tool. One of the most important aspects to creating fear and suspense in our films is by either withholding or dispensing information to our audience and characters. It sounds simple, and it is, but what your audience and characters know or don't know can be the key ingredient into making them feel uneasy. Maybe the audience is aware of the monster lurking around the corner, but the characters are not aware. Maybe the characters have seen the face of the killer, but the audience is still left in the dark. Either way, we can wield this information to manipulate the fears of our audience. Now that we've seen ways to build suspense and anticipation, let's look at the specific types of scares often found in horror and thriller films. These scare types can be mixed, matched, and blended together to your dark heart's content to create a myriad of unique scare types. So it really benefits you to mix and match these scare types together to create your own type of Frankenstein's monster. Jump scares are the most common types of scares in horror films, and they can lead into many of the other types of scares that we will feature later on in this list. Using musical or audio cues, quick camera cuts, and misdirection can help us to better scare our audience. Jump scares are most effective when they have lulled our audience to either a sense of complacency with a long take, or had them on the edge of their seat awaiting the scare only to fake them out a time or two before actually delivering on that scare, or by directing their attention in one direction only to spring the scare from somewhere else entirely. While it's not as sudden and directly impactful as a jump scare, the feeling of no hope or dread can be a scare type that sticks with an audience long after the film is over. Creating a foreboding feeling by the use of music, sounds, or locations can leave a lasting effect, and putting our characters in what feels like a hopeless situation can really mess with the psyche of our audience. The use of a bottleneck situation where the character feels trapped, or a character that is lost in the wilderness, or in a maze of death, are a few examples of a no-hope situation. Oftentimes, it's what we can't see that scares us the most in our horror films. 
Maybe we heard a strange sound coming from below and we are searching to find the source. Or maybe we see through the eyes of an unknown killer, but we don't know who or what it is. Only the last victim is aware of the true horror. Leaving the audience in the dark can play on the aspect of information and ambiguity and help build up to another scare, the reveal. When the horror of what we are actually facing is finally revealed, it can make our skin crawl. Whether we slowly reveal the face of a disfigured killer, or we have a masked killer leap at our characters from the shadows using a jump scare, when the horror is finally revealed on screen, the release of tension can be an effective horror creating technique. Body horror is another well-known type of horror scare, and it's usually achieved by showing a gratuitous amount of physical violence on screen. These gross-out scares are often associated with films like Hostel or the Saw franchise. Sometimes we don't even have to see the actual gore or violence to be affected by it. Like many of the traps featured in the Saw films, the mere idea of what the various contraptions can do is enough to freak us out. We can also use sound effects to disturb the audience even if the actual violent act is caught off screen. Another great scare tactic is to allow our audience to catch a glimpse of a danger that is unbeknownst to our characters. A shadowy glimpse of a ghost or a waiting killer in the background of the shot while our character goes about their life normally can be a great way to create tension. Another example of the use of information to create scares. A popular way to lead into a jump scare or a reveal scare is to create misdirection with our shots. Much like a magician tricking an audience with sleight of hand, we can lure our audience's attention in a desired direction and spring a scare from an unsuspecting angle, or we can create a false sense of safety by showing a scene that appears mundane, serene and calm, or depicting a feeling of happiness and fun, only to pull the rug out from under them at the last minute, revealing the darkness that waits below the surface. I hope you can use some of the examples featured in this video to create more effective scares in your films. And if you have any other examples that you think I missed, please share them with us in the comments below. I hope you found this video very beneficial, and if you did, please be sure to like this video, share it out on social media, and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos just like this. What's up guys? Does this look familiar? Hey guys, Ryan here. It's that time of year where I start obsessing over the horror genre. And today I thought I would dive into the process of how to create a day for night shot in our films. Shooting in a darkly lit environment can be quite a challenge for most productions, especially in low budget productions like most of us are involved in. And depending on the camera being used, especially if you're shooting with a mobile phone, the sensors in these cameras have a hard time achieving good results in low light conditions. Without the proper gear or crew, capturing clean images in darkly lit or nighttime environments can be next to impossible. But there are ways that we can shoot in brightly lit environments, even outdoors in the daytime, and make it look like it was shot at night. Here's how. Day for night shooting is achieved by combining several different techniques to create a believable illusion that a brightly lit shot was filmed in darkness. Let's first look at some ways that we can achieve this during production, and then we'll go on to look at some ways that we can make it look even more believable in post-production. During production and while filming, be sure to keep your exposure low and to avoid overexposure at all costs. Be sure to avoid capturing the sun in your shot, and be sure to also avoid capturing any reflections from the sun as well. If the audience sees the sun or its reflection, the illusion will be ruined. It's okay to have practical lights show up in the frame, but avoid the sun at all costs. Try to avoid shooting the sky if at all possible and frame the sky out of your shot, especially at midday when the sky is at its brightest and may overexpose your images. Use tall structures like buildings, trees, and mountains to block out the sun and the sky in your shots whenever you can. You can also try shooting at 
dawn or dusk to get proper exposure, and during these times, shadows will be at their longest, creating the illusion of moonlight. If you absolutely have to capture the sky in your shot, you can also try using an ND filter to help lower the exposure in your image. ND filters are basically sunglasses for your camera lens. To help achieve shadows that mimic nighttime, we can also do some things with our camera settings as well. When setting up your camera settings, you can try to shoot at an exposure about three stops below the standard. You can also try increasing your f-stop, use a faster shutter speed, or you can also use an ND filter like we mentioned earlier. We can also set our white balance to 3200K to help us achieve cooler temperatures. Our minds automatically associate nighttime or moonlight with cooler looking temperatures. Shooting with a warmer color temperature is going to remind the mind of daytime. Even though natural light from the moon happens to be white, Using a bluish tint to our images will help the mind and the viewer think that what they are seeing is happening at nighttime. It's possible to still achieve a day for night look using an overexposed image, but that's going to take a lot more work in post-production. Let's look at some ways that we can take everything we've learned about trying to shoot day for night with our cameras and add that to the techniques that we can use in post-production and bring everything together. Using all of these techniques together is going to make our day for night shot look a lot more believable. Once we are working with our images in post-production, we can try to lower our highlights in the image and bring the mid-tones up a bit. Next, we can adjust color and saturation in our images to help heighten that cooler temperature look that we're going for. Increasing the blue magenta look in our highlights and shadows is going to help sell the effect, and adding desaturation to the image is going to help a bit as well. If we absolutely had to frame the sky in our image, we can go as far as to do a sky replacement, but that's a technique for another video. We can also add effects like window light glow to images that have exteriors of buildings in them as well. As you can see, you don't need a big crew or a fancy camera to capture stunning nighttime imagery. Do you have any extra tips or techniques for capturing day for night shots with your camera? If so, please let us know in the comments below. Big thanks to our channel members, Andre Vandenhever, Romald Luindela, David Coles, and Paul Kane, who was our longest tenured member at almost 20 months. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to give it a like and share it out on social media. And if you're interested in learning and growing as a filmmaker alongside this awesome community, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and click the bell notification so you'll see more videos just like this one. Thank you so much for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan and I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Today's video, we're talking about how to create a no budget horror short with your iPhone. And that starts right now. Hello everyone, Ryan Camp here. Thank you so much for joining me today. This channel is all about learning and growing as a filmmaker, so please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already, and let's become better filmmakers together. Today we are talking about a new horror short that I put together for the channel to celebrate Halloween over the past week called 2AM. I shot this thing with my iPhone, very limited gear, um, next to no budget, and it was just me and my wife uh, that recorded this thing and put it together. Uh, so today I'm gonna walk through um, everything that we did to create the film, hopefully give you guys some inspiration with what you can do with limited gear and your mobile phone. And today you will notice that I am coming at you a broadcast style. Now we are not live, this is pre-recorded, but this is a really quick way for me to record content for you guys without having to set up a lot of gear. Everything's just right here, I hit record and we go. And to be quite honest, my life is absolutely insane right now. We have the holidays coming up, family visiting soon. Um, I've had about three close family friends pass away this last week. So things have just been really hectic around here and this is a really easy way for me to create content for you guys when I'm busy. So hopefully you guys um, enjoy this video. And if you do, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends on social media. So let's get started with the basics. Uh, 2 a.m. is a horror short that I put together with just me and my wife, some limited gear, basically no budget, and we put it together in about a couple of days to help celebrate the Halloween season. Many of you may know that I am currently shooting a black and white film noir style film called uh, The Trinity. It's currently in production. Uh, it's been taking up a lot of my time. It's uh, probably the most uh, ambitious thing I've ever done for sure. Uh, here on the channel, uh, lots of set design, lots of costumes, 
uh, lots of dialogue. Uh, so it's been a little bit of a challenge uh, getting everything right. It's going to have lots of VFX too. So I had to push back the release date for that, and we decided to release this short little horror film uh, in the meantime, uh, just as something fun to do for the channel. The idea for this short film actually came from one night I was, we have a driveway alarm, and one night I was awoken in the middle of the night around close to 2 a.m. Uh, by a group of deer wandering through the yard. And um, I don't know if you've ever been woken up abruptly in the middle of the night. Most of you probably have. But it's just one of the most uh, terrifying and settling things because you're so vulnerable while you're laying in bed. And um, just, you know, strange sounds, uh, abrupt sounds that wake you up in the middle of the night. It's just really terrifying. So I started to think about an idea for a short film about someone who was woken uh, awoken in the middle of the night by something loud or uh, something unsettling. So that was the basic idea of this film. And I started thinking about how I could show off uh, what time of night this was. And we really don't have alarm clocks anymore. And I remembered uh, when I was young, we had these retro looking alarm clocks. Uh, just about everybody had one. I actually have it right here. So I started looking around on eBay for a retro alarm clock like this so I could show the audience what time of the night this was without using like a cell phone or something. Um, so using that clock uh, in my mind, the time period for the film kind of went back to like, you know, 80s, 90s, somewhere in that area. So I decided to actually get a um, rotary telephone also to be in the film. Um, ordered both of those things off of eBay uh, probably spent maybe 50 bucks on both of those. And that was pretty much it for props uh, for the film. Um, actually, I'm thinking about doing a giveaway if anyone is interested in winning this clock uh, for themselves. Um, let me know. Maybe we'll do a giveaway and give that away to you guys, like some film memorabilia kind of stuff. So like I said, it, it took two days to shoot this thing. We shot this thing two days total, edited it, Two days total for everything. Um, I think the main thing I focused on for this film was getting the lighting uh, right in my mind. Uh, if you remember my previous video right before I released this film was on how to make a DIY cookie for film, film noir shadows, which I'm actually going to be using in the Trinity also. Uh, kind of a Venetian blind style thing that you put in front of your lights. If you haven't seen that video yet, please go check it out. I used this setup with one Godox light, probably in every shot in the film. Uh, so it was very handy. And I was really pleased with how it came out. And if you've ever tried to shoot... Uh, something with your mobile phone, you know that it doesn't perform that well in low light. So getting the light right was quite a challenge. Um, I had to use a lot more light than I really wanted to, uh, almost to the point to where I was blowing out my shots and then, you know, dialing it down almost to the point to where, you know, it's just a little bit overexposed, but not quite. I got it right there to the edge. Uh, otherwise, I was getting a lot of noise in my shots, and I still had a little bit of color banding and noise in some of the shots. If I had more time uh, to go back and, and reshoot some stuff, I probably would have, but overall, I'm pretty happy with how it looked, and uh, I thought that the DIY cookie that I use in a lot of the shots actually performed very well. I was really pleased with how a lot of those shadows turned out in the shots, and I think that's probably the standout um, aspect of this film, actually. So after I purchased my clock and the phone, I knew I had my set pieces for the film, so to speak. Um, I started writing down the shot list. Uh, the story is really bare bones. Uh, you know, a couple gets awoken in the middle of the night uh, by the loud phone ringing. Um, if you grew up in a time where these kinds of rotary phones or you know just landline phones were used, Oh, man, I hate the sound of these things. I did, every time a phone would ring, it would just grate my nerves. Uh, and um, I'm so glad that we have cell phones now that we can put on silent and we don't have to hear the phone ringing uh, because I really hate that sound. So I thought that was a really scary sound to wake up to. And uh, speaking of sound, I know that I, if, if you watch a lot of my content, you see that a lot of my videos, I'm pushing epidemic sound. And I'm not just blowing smoke 
Epidemic Sound is one of the greatest tools that I've ever used as a video or content creator or filmmaker. Um, I probably used about a hundred sound effects from Epidemic Sound in this short film. Their library of sound effects is just incredible. Uh, footsteps, uh, low drones, you know, horror music, anything you could possibly think of, bumping into a wall, a thud, um, creaking stairs, uh, the rotary phone sound, um, crickets. I used so many sound effects in this film. It would be half the film that it is if I didn't have access to Epidemic Sound. And if you want to try those guys out, you can follow the link in the description below and you'll get a free 30-day trial to check it out and you're supporting the channel. And like I said, I'm not just blowing smoke. It is an incredible service and I highly recommend if you're serious about making films or videos, I would definitely sign up for Epidemic Sound and check out their audio library because it is, mm, man, it's magnificent. I shot this on my iPhone 12 Pro Max. I don't have the 13 yet. Uh, hopefully, I'll be getting that soon and we'll do another short film with the 13. I'm always just like usually a step behind. I actually got the 12 Pro Max when it first came out. These YouTubers and stuff that constantly get the newest phone, I don't know how you guys do it. I just, I just can't afford to do it. But I shot this with the iPhone 12 Pro Max. I'm very familiar with its capabilities and what its, you know, what its limitations are. Uh, I used the Filmic Pro app, which, you know, is my favorite uh, video creation app for the iPhone. I uh, shot this thing in Log uh, V2, and I color graded it with uh, my Horror LUTs pack. Uh, if you're interested in picking that up and checking it out for yourself, it's in the digital store. That's also in the description below. I shot this with the Moondog Labs anamorphic lens. I absolutely adore this lens. I think it's, uh, you know, it's probably one of the... it's it's one of the best lenses you can get for your iPhone has the bayonet mount. I mounted it on my, it actually works with my moment case that I have on my phone. I used a Ulanzi phone cage to rig everything, put my mic on there. I used a Rode um, video mic pro on top of the rig. And like I said, I used one Godox SL 60 uh, light with the DIY cookie that I made to create those film noir shadows on many of the scenes. And I use that in just about every single scene, just that one single light. I thought it did a great job of illuminating all the scenes and creating some interesting shadows. So let's go ahead and walk through the shots of this film and we'll talk about each one. We'll go ahead and play the video here on the screen so you guys can check it out. Here we have this exterior shot. Uh, this is actually a family member's house exterior they allowed me to come shoot i knew that they had um i've used my the house my exterior of my house and uh, lots of my films i just wanted to try something different and i knew that this house had exterior lights some arc sodium lights that were set up by the power company outside so i knew it'd be a lot easier to get shots of the exterior at night because i knew i was going to lead need a lot of light since i was shooting with my iphone so i uh opted to go with this uh, we shot the rest of the film inside my home. Okay, this next shot here is the retro clock that I purchased. Started off on the time of 159. Slow uh, post processing uh, zoom in here, motion with the shot as it switches to two, added that thud, that shocking uh, sound. And here we have the, um, the telephone ringing as it's waking me up. I'm laying here in bed. You can see some of the subtle shadows created by the DIY cookie here and the one Godox light. You can see it on this shot as well. Now the actual, while I was filming this, I actually didn't know how I was going to end it. Um, this was guerrilla filmmaking. I knew that I was going to be awoken by the phone ringing. I was going to answer it and hear a strange voice. I didn't know what the voice was going to say. Here in this shot here, you can see as I bump into the wall, um, that T-shirt, if anybody knows what that T-shirt means, let, let me know in the comments below. It's kind of an inside joke. You'll notice that the phone has some weird markings on it. And if you look closely, it has some tape on it. I actually um, was going to use this phone in a different film. So I started kind of prepping it for that film. That's why it has the number six on it and some some. Uh, weathered tear on there um, but I actually haven't shot that film yet 
So that's why it kind of has those weird markings on it. But like I said, I didn't know what the voice was going to be saying. I knew I was going to hear some static. So I got some shots here, some close-up shots of me reacting to the voice on the other end of the line. And while I was filming this scene, I thought it would be really creepy if the voice told me that it was inside my house. Uh, so that's what prompted the character to start looking around the house um, for whoever this was, just to make sure, you know, it wasn't just, a, you know, it's more than a prank and, you know, there's not someone actually hiding in his house, which most sane people would probably do, I think. This shot right here was actually the most difficult for me to film. Uh, my wife is actually manning the camera here because I wanted to have the camera follow me as I walked into the other room. And this is probably the only scene in the film that was actually cut down a little bit. Uh, it was really long. Um, after I walk out of the bathroom here, I start to go into the next room and she actually followed me with the camera into our dining room where I peered out of the um, blinds in our dining room. Uh, the plan was, was to have the monster or ghost revealed here in this scene. When I walk into the dining room, we wanted to have kind of a creepy, smiling silhouette in the corner behind me, watching me. But it was proving to be really difficult to uh, do the VFX for that shot. It was going to take a lot of time, which was something I didn't have because I was shooting this and editing it in two days. So I decided to cut that uh, for the sake of time. And I actually think it ended up being better for the film because... Um, we don't get the reveal of the ghost until the end. And I think that has a lot more impact. Um, as I was fleshing this thing out and shooting it, uh, it became apparent that the creature on the other end of the line was some sort of electricity, uh, static based entity. So with that in mind, I started formulating what I wanted this creature to look like. Here we go into the next shot. I go back into the bedroom uh, where my wife is sleeping, who spoke to me earlier in the uh, first couple of scenes. Check the bathroom. And then here I am looking, um, getting ready to get into the bed, and I hear that static again, if you listen really closely, uh, coming from under the bed. I really like this shot. I like the sound of the wind as I'm looking under there. It kind of makes it seem like I'm peering into some other place. The final two shots of the film here, um, this shot where I'm getting in bed, the way I had to pull this off, is if you notice a little dip in quality here with the, the, the focus, I had to zoom in really close on my face. I had to go ahead and get my wife, who was wearing a full body morph, black morph suit. She's wearing that. She's sitting up in the bed beside of me. But I had to go ahead and get that entire shot, her in the shot and me in the shot, if that makes sense. And I zoomed in really close on my face. That way, when the reveal came, I could go ahead and just, in post-production, zoom the camera over to her face really quick for that shocking reveal at the end. Since both of us were going to be in the shot, I didn't really, I didn't really want to have to do any extra VFX. I wanted it to be as practical as possible because I knew I was going to have to do VFX on her face, um, and I did not know how long that was going to take. So I wanted to make it as easy on myself as possible. So I got both of us in the shot and then in post-production zoomed in closely on my face. So when the reveal happens, I could just whip the camera using some position and keyframes. I really like this last shot here of my wife as she's standing in the doorway with the silhouette. I thought that turned out really great as I realized there's something beside of me. And then we have the shocking uh, conclusion as he realizes he's sitting in bed with some sort of demon from another dimension. This was the first time that I've ever tried a jump scare like this. I usually don't like jump scares that much. I like uh, I like to create a feeling of tension and mood in my films, just unsettling feelings. That's how I usually prefer my horror. Almost like your soul's been stripped from your body and wrung out. That's what I like to go for when I go for horror. Not normally jump scares, but I figured this time I would try my hand at something different. Yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me that they thought it was uh, it was effective, so that's good to hear. Uh, for the face, I just took some uh, just uh, just a mishmash of different eyes and um, actually some dental um, some pictures of some dental work uh, to get that mouth, and I skewed it 
in Photoshop uh, to make it look like it's like a huge abnormal grin. And then I put it on my timeline in the correct space, had to do a little keyframe magic to get it uh, to move with the camera. Uh, so it ended up in the right spot. Then I used turbulent displace on the face to kind of make it morph and move around a little bit uh, after we see it. It's, it's just on the screen for a very short period of time. Uh, but, you know, and then for the eyes, I cut out the eyes with a mask and behind them, I put some broadcast static from a television behind that. It's really hard to see, but I think it just added just enough to give it that, you know, more more of a realistic look because you know when you're just dealing with images you want to give them a little bit of life so they're not so static uh no pun intended and then for the vi very final thing you know the the camera flashes i did all of that in post-production the the bright lights the horror sets in for our main character that something has happened and he's being either attacked or you know we don't know what happens but uh, the bright flashing, I did that in post-production as well. That is not practical. I just, uh, you know, increased the exposure for a couple of keyframes and, and brightened the scene up. And uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Um, that is 2 a.m. Uh, shot it, just me and my wife, two days to shoot and edit before Halloween. The story was inspired by me being awoken late at night and then further inspired by uh, a retro clock. Uh, which I purchased on eBay. Um, shot it with my iPhone 12 Pro Max, uh, the Moondog Labs anamorphic lens, the Ulanzi phone cage, one Godox SL60 Lite, and my DIY cookie, which you can watch a video on to see how I created it and make one for yourself. If you like the way the lighting looked in this film, it will help you achieve that look. And uh, big special thanks to Epidemic Sound and Filmic Pro for providing me the tools to take this thing to the next level and a big special thanks to you guys man you guys are awesome thank you for everyone that tuned in to the live premiere if you haven't seen the film yet please go watch it over and over again and share it with your friends on social media now this video will be going up early for our channel members special thanks to our newest channel members david coles clive bishop and paul kane who has been a member for eight months thank you guys so much for your support i really appreciate it if you're interested in becoming a channel member so you can watch videos like this a little bit earlier than everyone else and get access to exclusive discounts and content please just click the join button at the channel header and find out how you can become a channel member yourself I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it inspired you and I hope that you learned a little something. I know that I learned something creating it. Uh, it was a lot of first for me in a lot of ways. Thank you guys so much for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan and I will see you on the next video. Bye bye. On today's video, we're making an easy and affordable DIY light cookie. And that starts right now. Hey guys, Ryan here. Thank you so much for joining me today. This channel is all about learning and growing as a filmmaker. So please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already, and let's become better filmmakers together. And be sure to hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss my newest videos. Today I have a quick DIY tutorial for you guys on how to make a lighting cookie or a cucolorous as they're sometimes referred to if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I am currently in the process of shooting a short horror film to help celebrate the Halloween season called 2AM. And don't worry, I'm still in the process of shooting my new uh, black and white short film, The Trinity. Uh, just production has been pushed back a little bit and it's not going to be ready in time for the Halloween premiere like I'd originally hoped. But it's still in the works. For this new short horror film, I knew I wanted to have a lot of dramatic shadows and dramatic lighting in the short film. So I decided to create my own DIY lighting cookie to help me achieve those goals. If you're not familiar, a lighting cookie is basically a filter that you place in front of your lights, kind of like a lighting gobo, uh, but it's a little bit further away from your light source. And the cutout uses various shapes which you place in front of your light that helps cast shadows on your scene depending on what shapes you're using. And if you've ever searched for a gobo or cookie lighting kit online at sites like B&H, you will quickly be met with some sticker shock, which is why I decided to just create one myself. Now to create this plan for yourself, you will need a large piece of black foam board, 
You will need a ruler or a square, a straight edge, something like that to make some straight lines. You will need a measuring tape, some sort of cutting blade like an X-Acto knife or a razor knife, and a pencil. Since we are trying to create shadows in our image, I think it's important that we use a black piece of foam board and not white. That way our cookie is not bouncing light off of the cookie itself and creating more light in the scene. We want something that's going to absorb that light and not reflect it. And please be sure when you're using X-Acto blades or razor knives like this that you're using the utmost caution, practicing safety, and you're not cutting towards yourself. These things are very sharp and they will slice you open in a hurry. And also be sure to cut on a surface that you don't have to worry about damaging, like a cutting mat or just any other hard surface that you don't have to worry about damaging uh, because these blades will go through this foam board and cut into the surface below them. To begin with, I laid my foam board down on the flat surface and I decided to create my cookie using a vertical orientation. You can obviously use a horizontal orientation if you want, but I decided to cut mine in a vertical orientation. Which one works best? I don't know. So this thing doesn't get too flimsy and fall apart uh, sooner rather than later, I decided to measure in three inches from all sides and create a box which is going to be my guidelines or my starting lines. So we're going to measure and create a series of cuts that are one inch by about 13 and 7 eighths roughly. And no, this does not have to be perfect, but try to do your best. So I'm going to measure out these series of cuts going all the way up from guideline to guideline, just trying to create as many as I can within those guide sections without going over. Once you have all of these one inch by 13 and 7 eighths cuts made, you're pretty much done. Now we just need to grab a light stand and secure our cookie on the light stand using clips or whatever you have available. And we just place our light behind the cookie to create awesome shadows on our scenes. Just play around with the placement of your cookie and your light until you get the desired look. And if you're more artistic than I am, you can definitely create all sorts of different shapes and different cookies that you can use in different scenes to create things like fence posts, uh, different window shapes. The possibilities are as endless as your creativity. For today's discussion, just let me know in the comments below if you've ever used a cookie like this and if you plan on using this plan to create your own. I hope you guys found this video very beneficial and if you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe if you haven't already. Big thanks to all of our channel members and to all of you for your continued support. Thank you so much for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan and I will see you on my next video which is probably going to be my new horror short 2AM. Thank you and bye bye. On this video, we're talking about tips for lighting horror films and that starts right now. Hey guys, Ryan here. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that my favorite time of year is the Halloween season. So to help celebrate the spooky season, I thought that today we would dive into ways that we can improve the lighting in our horror films. But before we get started, if this is your first time here, this channel is all about learning and growing as a filmmaker. So please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already, and let's become better filmmakers together. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please check out our digital store where you can find awesome filmmaking resources like our Horror Lutz Pack. The link is in the video description. These lighting tips can apply to all sorts of genres of film, but today we're specifically focusing on lighting horror films. So without any further ado, let's get started. Tip number one, low key lighting. Low key lighting is a style of lighting that emphasizes shadows, which is appropriate for many scenes in horror. For this style of lighting, we will use hard lighting. Our goal is to increase the contrast of the subject and the environment that they inhabit. For this method, we will ditch traditional three-point lighting on our subject and use just one single key light. This will help to create shadows on our subject's face. This can help you mold the shadows on your subject more to your liking. While low-key lighting is used in all sorts of dramatic films, it is often a go-to look for many horror films. So this is a useful technique to learn for all sorts of narrative film work. Tip number two, backlighting. Backlighting is one of the most important aspects of lighting horror in my opinion. Backlighting isn't just used in horror filmmaking, so this step is useful for all sorts of lighting situations. But it can make a world of difference when trying to create a scary mood. 
Backlighting is great for creating silhouettes in your images and can help you show the audience the darkness that inhabits your scene. Add in a little fog and you have yourself a very moody image, perfect for horror filmmaking. Much like the name implies, backlighting is achieved by lighting our subject from the back. We will face our light source towards the viewer and have our subject in between the light source and our camera, which will create moody shadows and silhouettes. Tip number three, background lighting. Lighting the backgrounds of our images is important for all types of filmmaking, but can be especially important when trying to create a dark or moody image. If we are lighting our subjects with low-key lighting like we mentioned earlier, and our background is completely black, it will make our images appear more like a stage show than a film. It's usually best to have at least a touch of light on the background behind our subject to add depth and mood to our images. We can also light only the background and place our subject in between our lit background and the camera. If we forego lighting on our subject in this case, we create a variation of the backlighting setup that we mentioned earlier, creating a silhouette of our subject between the viewer and the background. Tip number four, natural daylight. I have found that when creating horror films and creating a daytime scene, I usually get the best results when using natural lighting from windows as my main source of light or just using the natural sunlight when outdoors and using reflectors or diffusion when necessary. For indoor scenes, using the available light that you have and adding visual interest using practical lights in your background can help make all the difference when creating moody images. This tip is mainly just my personal preference. I prefer my horror to have daytime images that appear to be underexposed. I just feel that it helps maintain the mood and tension even when the sun is shining. Tip number five, uplighting. Now this next technique should only be used when it has a practical reason for being in your story, but uplighting your subject or the flashlight look can be a cool way to create an unnatural look on your subject's face. This can be achieved by using campfire light, flashlights, candles, or reflectors. Just make sure it has a reason for existing in your story. Tip number six, oversaturated lighting. This next step is also a technique that is usually used very sparingly. Saturating your image completely with one color of light like red or blue can be an effective way to create tension, a feeling of danger, or an intense mood. This can be achieved by using red or blue gels on your lights, or it can be achieved in post using LUTs on your images. Tip number seven, window lighting. Whether you're creating a daytime scene or a nighttime scene, placing lighting outside of your scene pointed in through windows can be a great way to light your scene. These lights can be controlled using gels to create a look of moonlight, or they can just create a more controllable daylight look for your scene. Tip number eight, underexposing your images. This tip is pretty self-explanatory and pretty simple to explain. While filming, just be sure to underexpose your image more than you think you need to, creating a darker image. Just be sure to not underexpose your image so much that you're losing quality in the image and you should be okay. And my final technique for horror lighting is spotlighting. This is another tip that should be used in specific circumstances and only when it makes sense in your story. Unless, of course, you're going for something a little more abstract. Using spotlights and scenes, mainly by way of a flashlight, is a great way to create scares and tension in your scenes. It can be really terrifying when we see a character's point of view as they search around an environment using a flashlight. And the way a flashlight beam affects a character's face can be really distorting and really freaky if done correctly. And there you have it guys, just a small taste of things that we can all do to help improve the lighting in our horror films. Question of the day, do you have any additional tips for lighting horror that you feel like I forgot or left out? Please let us know in the comments below. A big special thanks to our monthly channel members. If you would like to find out how you can become a channel member and help support this channel, please click the join button located on the channel header above. You can help signal boost this video and help more people see it by liking, subscribing, and sharing it with your friends on social media. And if you do, you have my sincere thanks. Thank you so much for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan, and I will see you on the next video. Bye-bye.
Hi, my name is Ryan, and this is the story about how I made a stay-at-home short horror film during the global pandemic of 2020. Mostly by myself, with quite a bit of help from my beautiful wife, and using mostly the resources that I already had available to me. Aside from the incredible audio library provided by Epidemic Sound, which we'll get to later. This is the making of The Worst of Fears. This video contains huge spoilers for the film, so if you haven't seen The Worst of Fears yet, I highly encourage you to go watch the film first and then come back here to see how it was made. Thank you and enjoy. Hey guys, Ryan here. I hope you're doing well. It is August, Saturday the 29th, 2020, 6.29 p.m. If you're watching this, hopefully that means I have finished my newest short film, The Worst of Fears, and it's been uh, uploaded to the channel. Uh, I'm hoping to get it done sometime uh, near Halloween of 2020, uh, sometime around October 31st or maybe the week before. So if you're watching this video, that means that I have completed the film and this is the making of The Worst of Fears, the behind the scenes, if you will. It's the first time I've ever tried to do anything like this where I'm filming the making of the film while I'm making the film. I'm trying to shoot this film completely by myself as much as I can. I am going to have my wife help me out a few times here and there just to see what I can accomplish on my own during a quarantine where we can't really go out and do much and be around too many different people. Um, I'm trying to do this as frugal as possible with a, using as little bit of money as possible, but I am planning on maybe we're going to see how things go near the end, but I am planning on maybe spending quite a bit of money for the big uh, final scene. Um, maybe purchasing a really fancy prosthetic or a mask or something like that to make my creature at the end of this thing kind of stand out and look really special. But we'll see how things go. Tonight we are planning on shooting the very first three scenes in the film, which are like an opening shot of the... Uh, road as the car is driving down the road you should be seeing that scene right now and um what i'm going to use to film that is this guy right here this is a uh, car mount for your camera uh, what it does is just you you know you pop the suction cups on there and then tighten it down and it sticks in place and uh, you can film inside your car i will post a link to this guy below i don't know if i would trust this this mount to mount my camera to the outside of my vehicle while it's moving. I don't think it's quite strong enough for that, especially if you're using, uh, I'm gonna be shooting this film with the Panasonic GH5 and my Sigma R 18 to 35 lens with the Metabone Speed Booster on there. So the camera itself is a little on the heavy side, but it does mount nice to the inside. It, it supports the camera pretty nice. So we're gonna, Basically, the first scene is just going to be me driving down the road, the camera facing out towards the road. Um, I'm going to show you guys some storyboards that I drew up for the scenes that should be coming up right now. Uh, but the first scene is just going to be me driving down the road. I'm going to go down some country roads here where I'm not going to meet much traffic. I want it to feel really lonely. And then we're going to get a shot of my wife driving by me down the street as I get the car as it's passing me. And then we're going to get a shot of the car as it's pulling into the driveway of the house. So that's what we're planning on shooting tonight, and we're going to see how things go. The ideas and process for this film started all the way back in January of 2020. I knew that I wanted to create a Halloween special of sorts for the channel at some point, so I started mulling over the ideas in my head back then. I've always felt like the idea of taking a shower by yourself when you're home alone late at night is a pretty scary and vulnerable uh, position to be in. So that's really where the idea for this film started. When I first start coming up with the ideas for a film, I'll just play the ideas over and over in my head until I develop them further. Basically watching the movie in my head every day while I'm daydreaming. Once I have the first few scenes played out in my head, I'll sit down and write out a shot list or draw some storyboards to get things started. Okay, action. Hey guys, so it's late at night here. I'm getting ready to film an interior car scene uh, for the beginning of the film when the main character, which is gonna be played by me, is driving down the road and I'm getting some shots of the 
uh, stereo and some interior shots of me talking on the phone to kind of set the stage for the film. Now, I am putting this in my van. I'm going to mount this guy right here. I'm gonna mount my camera on this window unit here and get a close up of the radio. This isn't actually the car that I'm gonna be driving in the film, but the car that I wanna use for the film is really tight on the inside and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get my camera set up properly in there. So I'm gonna be shooting it here in this van. It's a lot more spacious. And if I use the right kind of shots and angles, I don't think anyone's gonna notice in the final film anyway. Uh, the shots that I'm going to have of me are going to be close and tight on um, on my face and hands, and you're really not going to see much of the interior of the car anyway. So that's kind of my thought process of going through this. I'm going to get the camera mounted here. I'm actually having to take uh, my cage and everything off here because it's just way too heavy to mount to the window here. So I'm going to get that taken off. I'm going to mount the camera up and I'm going to drive down the road and see if I can get these shots. Okay, so after a painfully aggravating process, I finally have my cage off my camera. I really hate having to take that off because it's such a pain in the butt to get right and I had it just where I wanted it. But anyway, I've got everything set up now. I'm going to put my uh, Rode Video Mic Pro on the top of the camera here just to get some on-camera sound. Uh, I might overdub everything depending on how noisy or how it turns out later. But uh, since this was such a pain in the butt to get going, I was only planning on filming one shot tonight of me just turning the radio off. But I think, what was that? But I think I'm gonna get <clears throat> go ahead and get two shots. I'm gonna get the shot of me talking on the phone as well. So that requires me going in and changing into my costume and uh, we're gonna see how it goes. Let's do it. Okay, I've had my wife do some makeup on me and I've got my little uh, shirt and tie on, which is what the character is gonna be wearing in the film. And uh, got my camera set up, ready to drive down the road and try to get these shots. Hey it's, hey, it's me. I was hoping to catch you before your flight left, but I guess that didn't happen. Uh, I'm almost home now, but if you call me back tonight, I'm probably either in the shower or dead asleep. I am absolutely dead tired, and this, I'm this all up. Hey guys, so we're about to film a scene um, with the camera set up outside looking in as I'm looking out of an interior window. I've got a aperture light panel here. My wife is helping me get focus. I'm bouncing, bouncing the aperture light off of a um, white bounce to kind of soften it up a little bit. I still want the light to be harsh, but I don't want it to be too bright in her face. And then outside I've got my camera set up with this light wand here that's putting off another blue light and I'm actually shooting through I don't know if you can see it but I'm shooting through this bush to kind of make that frame a little more interesting we're going to see how it turns out usually when I'm making a film I'll start editing the scenes as I shoot them so the editing process starts really from day one I find that editing this way gives me a better idea of where the film is headed, what shots are working and what shots aren't, and sometimes I'll come up with even more ideas while I'm editing for more scenes that I might want to shoot later. This scene here where I'm walking down this pathway is one of two shots in the film where my wife is operating the camera. All of the other shots in the film are either with the camera on a tripod or I'm holding it handheld. Usually when I'm making a film by myself and a lot of the shots are on a tripod, I will add in camera movement in post to give the effect of handheld camera movement when I think it's needed.
I had had the idea early on when thinking about this film that I wanted the man to encounter different kinds of figments of his imagination around the house. And while I didn't get to film very many of these scenes, this first one here where he opens the door and sees the Lovecraftian style tentacle monster, I had originally planned on creating the tentacles myself and doing a practical effect, but this proved to be a little bit too difficult. So I opted to use stock footage of a squid monster, which I found on Pond 5. I used the ultra key effect to key it out, and I blurred it a little bit with some camera blur, put it in the foreground of the image, and voila, there you have your tentacle monster hiding in the shadows. Hey, it's me. Um, give me a call back as soon as you get this. I'm a little bit freaked out. I came home and the door was standing wide open. Just want to make sure everything's open. Damn it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and start rolling. This is the refrigerator scene. My wife is going to put on a black jumpsuit. It's like a full body suit and walk around in the background. While I look for something in the fridge, we're gonna time it out with some um, audio cues and see if we can time this scene and block it out just right. All right, let's do it. For these bathroom scenes, I actually ran into a bit of trouble when trying to light them. I don't know if it had anything to do with me wearing a white shirt, which is usually uh, not a very good idea when you're gonna be on camera. I wish I'd have went back and put on a black shirt instead. But it also could have had something to do with the actual white bathtub in the room. The light was bouncing around and bouncing off of it in different and weird ways. And I really had a hard time getting the light to look just how I wanted in these scenes. And let me just say that trying to film yourself in a bathtub and get some really cool angles and some good shots is not very easy, especially when you're actually running the water. Uh, it's really hard to operate your camera and things are slippery and you don't really have that much room in the bathtub itself. So the shots really didn't have much depth to them. And I wasn't really happy with the way the shots turned out inside the bathtub, but hey, I did the best I could. The sound effects and music played a huge part of this project, and I wouldn't have been able to pull it off if it weren't for the great resources at Epidemic Sound. I was able to find almost every sound effect and musical note I needed for this project, except for one, and that was a squeaky bathtub sound where my main character was getting murdered and was flailing around in the bathtub. But other than that, every sound effect almost that you hear in the film, if it wasn't recorded in camera, in the shot, was obtained from EpidemicSound.com. And I cannot recommend that service enough. If you are looking for high quality music and sound effects for your film, that is the place to go. They have almost everything you could possibly imagine. Okay, here we go. 
the killer in this film, which I haven't come up uh, with a name for yet, if you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments below, uh, wears a mask that I purchased from Amazon.com. It's a $50 um it's called a beauty mask or something like that but yeah that's what i wore in the film for the killer and i actually went in and did some tracking with mocha in after effects and i blacked out my eyes and you kind of shadowed them up a little bit so you couldn't see my actual eyes i thought it gave it a little bit more of a creepier look For the gruesome stabbing scene, I actually used a real knife, which I do not recommend anyone doing. Um, I'll probably never do this again. It was really dangerous, especially being in that wet bathtub while we were filming. But I used a mannequin or a makeup uh, head that I had that I usually use to get focus. My intention was to cut this thing open and stick a blood pack in there. And when I stab the knife through, get a close up of it. And when I stab the knife through, have the blood spurt out but the blood came out way too slow and I did not get the effect I wanted but the stab itself actually looked usable so I ended up using that in the film but if I had to go back and do it again I would probably try a different method um, I had intended on maybe filling a, a milk jug up with a fake blood and putting something over in front of that and stabbing through that probably would have worked out better in the long run for the actual blood to pour out but, you know, like everything you do, you have to um, kind of change things up on the fly when things aren't working. And I just settled for a different route. And overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, it's a really quick scene, so you don't really get to dwell on it too long and dissect it. Uh, the skin tone probably doesn't match my skin very well, but all in all, I think it's a close-up shot, so it's really fast, and not too many people are going to pick it apart. It does pull off the notion that a knife is going into something, and uh, it makes my wife squirm, so I think uh, it's mission accomplished. Hey guys, it is October 27th, um, exactly three days before the premiere of the film. And we actually have a few more scenes to shoot. I started editing the film probably at the end of September sometime, uh, just putting together what I had so far. So the edit is getting really close to being finished with the footage I have. Tonight we are reshooting uh, the refrigerator scene and I have to shoot the very final scenes of the film where the killer is going to be leaving the house, getting in the murdered victim's car and leaving. Uh, so in, all in total we have about three scenes to shoot tonight. I may actually reshoot some of the bathroom scenes as well. Um, I'm not sure why, but I had a really hard time getting the lighting and the angles right in the bathroom scenes, uh, specifically in the shower. You know, it's just a completely white bathtub, so the light's kind of bouncing around in weird ways. So I kind of ran into some issues getting the light the way to look the way I wanted in those scenes. So I may look over the footage today and decide if I want to reshoot some of that stuff. But other than that, we shouldn't have more than four shots to get tonight. So hopefully I can, you know, really put in some work these next couple of days and finish up this edit and have it ready for the premiere Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Eastern Standard Time. So wish us luck. Uh, it's really coming down to the wire uh, last minute here. So, but I think we can do it. I think I can pull it off. Um, it's gonna be tough. And you know, it's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be the perfect film that I always envisioned in my head. You always have to make some sacrifices and change things around that you didn't intend to change around. Um, I also have to do some audio overdubbing uh, for a few of the lines, uh, specifically the lines where I'm talking on the phone in the car. They're really noisy and I'm going to try to overdub them and get it to sound right. If I can't, I will use the original audio and just try to clean it up the best I can. But hopefully I can um, overdub those lines and get them sounding pretty good and believable. Hey, it's me. I was hoping to catch you before your flight left, but I guess that didn't happen. Hey, it's me. Uh, I was hoping to catch you before your flight left, but I guess that didn't happen. All right. so. I'm just waiting for the sun to go down. As you can see, it's really cloudy and nasty out here today. Really moody, so it kind of fits the uh, 
the spooky season. So anyway, wish us luck and hopefully we'll get this thing finished up for you guys. All the scenes for the film had been shot and I was pretty happy with it. But just when I thought I was on the road home to finishing this thing, Mother Nature stepped in and seemed intent on stopping me from finishing this film on time. Hey guys, so it is October 29th, about uh, 11.30 in the morning. Um, as you can see, it's really windy and crazy out here. Um, Hurricane Zeta is moving through the area. We've got wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. Um, pretty scary, had a few trees uh, fall in the backyard here and see there's just limbs and debris everywhere. But anyway, um, I was in the process of putting the final touches on the worst of fears last night. Um, I figured I would wake up this morning and get it done. I didn't realize how early the storm was gonna be moving through. But while I was in the middle of exporting and uploading the very final edit of the film, the power went out, the internet went out. So I think I'm gonna to try to get out our generator and fire it up and see if I can get this thing uploaded in time for the live premiere tomorrow. So we'll see how it goes. All right, I got the generator out. I'm gonna to try to fire this bad boy up and finish this film. Crisis averted. Thanks to the generator, I was able to finish editing the film, get it uploaded, and share it with the world. And after that, it was on to work on the story that you're watching right now. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please check me out at ryancampfilms.com. Check out the YouTube channel. Big thanks to Epidemic Sound for sponsoring this video and providing me with an epic, epic collection of music and sound effects that I use in the film. It was absolutely phenomenal. And The Worst of Fears would have been half the film that it is today without all those awesome sound effects and the music especially. How can we create suspense in our films? First, let's take a look at the definition of suspense. Suspense can be defined as a state or feeling of excited or anxious uncertainty about what may happen. And in the works of fiction, it's defined as a quality in a work of fiction that arouses expectation or uncertainty about what may happen. So basically, it's the tension of waiting for something that may happen. Suspense is a great tool that filmmakers can utilize to create excitement, fear, and add entertainment value to their work. Whether you're creating a horror film or just an action thriller, creating suspense is an important part of the filmmaker's arsenal. But how can we create suspense in our films? Let's first take a look at how to create suspense in a fundamental way in our stories. And then we'll take a look at other tools we can use to layer on top of that and make it work for an audio-visual medium. Alfred Hitchcock is arguably the master of suspense in cinema. Let's hear what he has to say on the matter, and then we'll go from there. In order to get suspense, you provide the audience with a certain amount of information and leave the rest of it to their own imagination. According to Hitchcock, suspense can be created when we give the audience information that might be unknown to a few or all of the characters on screen. Hitchcock further illustrates this point by saying that suspense is like two people sitting at a table discussing football, but a bomb unknown to the audience is under the table. The bomb goes off, killing both people at the table. 
While the audience was provided a few seconds of shock to this event, no suspense was created because they had no previous knowledge that the bomb even existed. They didn't see it coming. Knowledge and information is the key. Now if we play the same scene again, this time giving the audience previous knowledge of the bomb under the table, we can have the people sitting at the table talking about football, dragging out the conversation, and make the audience squirm with anticipation. Then we can even subvert expectation. The bomb never goes off. We relieve them of their stress and tension. So we can deduce that a simple way to create suspense is to give the audience information, leading them to think that something will or could happen, foreshadowing things to come. Author Dan Brown says that suspense is about making and keeping promises. You say to the reader, keep reading and I'll tell you how or why it's going to happen. We can create suspense at the story level by making promises to our audience, things that they know will eventually come to pass. We can drag out the tension of suspense by waiting until the last minute to finally deliver on that promise, sprinkling little teases throughout that the promise will be fulfilled much earlier. We can also create parallel plot lines in our stories, having two or more characters that are connected in some way, heading on a collision course towards one another. As the audience, we know at some point, going by the information that we've been given, that the characters will intersect with one another at some point. We just don't know when or where. Another way to create suspense at the story level is to withhold information from our audience. I know it goes against everything we've mentioned up until now, but it works. Secrets can also create tension in our audience. We're still using information to create the tension, but in this case, we're keeping the information to ourselves, not letting the audience in on the secret. To illustrate how this can be achieved, let's say that a character is searching for a box in an old attic or closet. As the audience, we know that they've been looking for this particular box, but we don't exactly know why. Finally, during their search, the character gets really excited. They find the box and start digging inside. Frantically, they pull out a photo from the box, staring in amazement and shock. The only thing is, the audience doesn't get to see what's on the front of that photo. We are left as the audience wondering what this big secret could be. And it's the filmmaker's responsibility to deliver on that secret in an entertaining way at some point. How you weave and deal information out to your audience through the course of your film or story makes all the difference in how successful you can create tension and suspense. It's all about information. But filmmaking is an audio-visual medium, right? What are some audio and visual tools that we can use alongside our story-written suspense to help add to that tension? I'm glad you asked. One way that we can build suspense visually is to extend the scene. That's right. Give your character breathing room and time to anticipate, or your audience time to anticipate what's about to happen. Slow, methodical pacing can really help build tension.
We can also use depth of field to create suspense, but having something going on in the background that our character in the foreground doesn't see coming. Again, the audience can see what's happening, but our character in the foreground is clueless. The information that the audience has and the character doesn't creates the suspense. We can also use long tracking shots to help create suspense. We know something is about to happen to our character, but he doesn't. The camera follows the character for an uncomfortable amount of time. No cuts in the edit. This creates a more realistic feeling in the edit. It's like we are there with the character. Engaging our audience more can help create more suspense. Of course, music and sound can be a huge help when creating suspense. Whether you're slowly building up a droning tone or a single piano note to create suspense, or you make your scene as quiet as possible, letting the audience hear their own heartbeat. Audio tools are an important part of creating more suspense in your scenes. And finally, lighting can be a really important part of creating suspense in a scene. Our character in the foreground is perfectly lit, but something is moving in the darkened shadows behind them. The audience knows something is back there, but we don't know exactly what. If only we could let the character on screen know somehow. This is how we create suspense in our films. I hope you found this video very beneficial, and if you did, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan, and I will see you on the next video. Bye-bye. On this special Halloween edition of the Piedmont Motion Picture Show, we're making three different types of fake blood for your next film project, and that starts right now. Hey guys, Ryan Kemp with the Piedmont Motion Picture Company. Thank you so much for joining me today. This channel is all about learning and growing as a filmmaker. So if that's your thing, please give this video a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and let's become better filmmakers together. You may notice that things look a little bit different today, and that's because I'm coming at you from my kitchen because things are about to get messy. I bid you welcome. That's right, my favorite time here in North Carolina is just around the corner, that's fall, which means that Halloween is not too far away. Now for my money, there are three different types of theatrical blood used in filmmaking. There's oozing, dripping blood, there's thick, coagulated scab blood, and there's watery, spraying types of blood. Well today, we're going to take a look at how to make all three types of blood using safe and cost-effective recipes. So first, we're going to take a look at how to make the most common type of fake blood, which is the oozing, dripping, vampire-style blood, which sort of resembles something that you might buy off the store shelf at Walmart or a Halloween store when the time rolls around. Okay, to make your standard tried and true vampire blood, you're going to need these items. First things first, food coloring can stain your clothes and skin, so be sure to wear some latex gloves and some old clothing or possibly an apron before getting started. You're going to need corn syrup, corn starch, water, powdered cocoa, red and blue food coloring, something to mix it with, and a mixing container. First, add two thirds of a cup of corn syrup to your mixing bowl. Now add in one third of a cup of water and mix it up. Next, add five teaspoons of corn starch, one tablespoon of powdered cocoa, and then mix it all up. Now we can start adding our food coloring to help bring this blood to life. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. Add in four or five teaspoons of red food coloring and then slowly add in drops of blue food coloring until the blood is the color you want. Be sure not to overdo it with the blue food coloring because it's very powerful and it can make your blood look black if you go too far. To me, darker blood always looks more realistic, but it's possible to go a little bit too far with the blue food coloring. If you need to make the blood thicker, just add more corn syrup until it's the consistency that you like. Let's see how this blood looks on camera. 
Okay, now let's take a look at how to make the thick, coagulated blood, sometimes referred to as scab blood. In the special effects world, coagulated blood or scab blood is used to make that fresh cut look. It's really thick so it doesn't drip and run and it stays in place. It can be used to create depth inside of a wound. Now, there are several different ways we can make scab blood, some of them containing dangerous substances. But for our safe at home version, we will be using aloe vera gel as our base. We will also need red and blue food coloring, some stirring sticks, a mixing container, protective gloves as the food coloring can stain your skin, an empty container, and a plastic baggie. To make the scab blood, simply add a few drops of red food coloring into your mixing container full of aloe vera. The amount of aloe vera just depends on how much blood you're wanting to make. After you get a nice red color, start to add drops of blue to darken the blood up a bit. You can use blue and green food coloring to get the blood a really dark color. Just play around with it until you get something you're happy with. I personally prefer my scab blood to be really dark. Now, scoop all of your coagulated blood into the plastic bag. Squeeze it all down into one corner. Cut off the tip of the bag's corner and use it to pour the blood into your empty container. Now you have it for later use. You can also use the plastic baggie method to apply the blood later for situations in where you need to be very delicate and precise. Now let's see how it looks on camera. Okay, last but not least, let's take a look at how to make that thin spraying type of blood for when we really wanna make a mess on set. This recipe is really simple. Since we are trying to make blood that is easy to spray and splash all over the place, we just need to add color to water. That's right, just add food coloring to your water until it's the color that you like and it's ready to spray. Just remember that food coloring can stain clothing and skin. This will make the blood easy to work with if we're going to be pumping it through hoses and such for projectile blood. You may be able to get away with adding a little bit of corn syrup to this blood recipe for making it drip a little bit more realistically. But don't overdo it as then you won't be able to spray it all over the place. How does it look on camera? And one final tip. If you want to add thick chunks to any of these blood recipes to give them that extra gross barfy look, just add onion flakes to them. This will give the blood the appearance of little fleshy bits for that extra gross out factor. And that's it guys, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Question of the day. Have you ever used any of these fake blood recipes or have you tried something different? If so, let us know in the comments below. If you would like to support the channel, please be sure to check out our online digital store for awesome filmmaking resources, including our new Horror Lutz Pack. If you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful, please give this video a thumbs up and please consider subscribing if you haven't already. This episode of the Piedmont Motion Picture Show has been brought to you by our incredible patrons over on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. I hope you guys have a safe and wonderful Halloween season. Thank you so much for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan and I will see you on the next Piedmont Motion Picture Show. Bye bye. Today on this special Halloween edition of the Piedmont Motion Picture Show, I'm going to give you some tips and techniques for making your very first horror short film. So let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to the Piedmont Motion Picture Show. I am Ryan Camp, and this channel focuses on short films and how to make better short films and become better filmmakers. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, entertainment or learning, please consider subscribing. You know, horror films are one of my favorite genres, and you're probably gonna see a lot more horror films coming to the channel in the near future. I just love coming up with uh, story ideas and different concepts for horror, and I have a ton of scripts written, I just gotta get around to making them. But today I wanted to focus on color grading, story ideas, uh, story writing, um, camera angles, just all kinds of tips and techniques that we can use to make better horror films. All of these things are of course important to any type of film, but today I'm gonna skew things in the horror direction in celebration of the Halloween season. 
So without any further ado, let's get started. First up is story. Story is king, even in horror. You've heard it before, and although horror can sometimes be known for being a genre that has tired tropes, campy characters, and predictable outcomes, there are ways to create new and fresh spins on some of these classic ideas. Whether you're writing a cheesy slasher script or a mind-bending psychological horror thriller, getting a good concept and story down is very important. One thing I do to get the creative juices flowing when I'm trying to come up with story ideas for horror is to read through old collections of horror short stories that I used to read as a kid. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, the Edgar Allan Poe collection, and other anthology books have stories in them that have been passed down through the generations. You can take some of these ideas and give them new life by putting your own spin on them. Also, if you're looking to work out your script writing muscles as it pertains to the horror genre, I recommend checking out Writing Horror by the Horror Writers Association. It's a really great book that takes insights from a collection of great horror writers as they break down how to write better dialogue, plot ideas, types of horror stories, and even how to write scary stories geared towards children. A really great book that can definitely help get the ideas rolling. I'll put a link in the description below. Next up is time of day, weather, or atmosphere. Weather and time of day are going to play a huge part in dictating what type of atmosphere and mood your film will convey. Will your film be a slasher film that takes place entirely inside a house? Or will it be a sprawling epic that goes indoors and out, taking your audience through a hair-raising chase into a dark and blustery wooded area? These are all things to consider when coming up with your film idea. Not all horror movies have to take place at night or during a rainstorm. Sometimes having bad things happen in the bright hot sun of midday can be pretty creepy too. Just look at films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Blood, sweat, and tears in broad daylight. Just remember that if you're really having to have something like a rainstorm in your film, unless you're going to wait for the perfect moment to shoot, you may have to create some sort of DIY rain machine or risk having to rewrite your scenes or change crew members and actors during production due to scheduling issues. So keep that in mind. Sound. Sound is so very important to your horror film, and it goes hand in hand with your visual atmosphere and creating the mood that your horror film is trying to portray. Check out some of these clips from my horror short, The Farmhouse, with and without extra sound design, and see what a huge difference it makes. See what I mean? Always put in that extra effort when you're finishing up your sound design and create or find sound effects for as many little things as you can. Viewers take notice when sounds are missing and it will leave your production feeling hollow and amateur if you don't fill in all the gaps. Lighting is of course important in any film, but when dealing with horror we have a chance to use a few different lighting techniques that may usually be out of place in other films. In horror we can use natural shadows to our advantage. For instance, in horror, underexposing your footage can be extremely effective, as it will leave more areas in the shadow and help create a more mysterious vibe. Try not to rely on color grading to darken your footage too much later. Naturally light your scene by underexposing and using natural shadows. Try using just one stop of underexposure. That way you can set the tone and your footage won't be pushed too far. You can still have some room to play around with a look in post. Don't forget that there are many types of horror LUTs that you can find online. 
I used a horror LUT pack to color grade the farmhouse. The look I was able to get was pretty great and I was really happy with it, especially in combination with the atmosphere and the blustery, rainy, windy day that I had when I was shooting. Don't be afraid to use color gels to get stark, unnerving color looks. And you can also use haze to help bring more depth and mystery to your shots. If you can't afford a haze machine, you can use a spray haze like I do. Here is the brand I use. I'll put a link to purchase this in the description. It works really great. If there were ever a good time to use gels, a horror movie definitely fits the bill. It's one of the best times you can uh, use really stark colors like reds and blues to really create a sense of dread or coldness. Uh, you can use them like I have here behind me. You see I have the blue and the red here on the um, right side of my face. Or you can use natural light and use the shadows to your advantage. You can also create silhouettes by having a nice contrasting backlight and not lighting your subject from the front, kind of like this. As you can see, it creates a pretty cool look and there are tons of ways you can do this. Just play around with it and get uh, the look that you're going for in your film. Camera angles. There are also some unique ways that we can use camera angles in horror films. Extreme close-ups can really help your audience feel intensity. But on the other end of the spectrum, wide, distant shots of our actors can really be effective when trying to create a sense of dread or anticipation. You can create a creepy, voyeuristic vibe by shooting through something at a distance, like a window perhaps, giving us a bird's eye view of the terror stalking our protagonist. Using methods like the Dutch tilt can help make your audience feel off balance, confused and uneasy. Just think of any unconventional angle when shooting that may make your audience feel unsettled and you'll have yourself a winner. Just don't overdo it. Location, location, location. Having a great location for any film can really make things so much easier by giving you beautiful things to show your audience. Not only does your location help stir the imagination of your audience, but it can also help give you great ideas for your film as well. In some cases, the location can even be the star of the horror movie. Take extra time to scout out locations for your film. Call around and post on social media for what you're looking for. You'll be really surprised at how easy it is to find the perfect location. And to make things official, always offer to pay the property owner for their time. And be sure to draw up a location shooting agreement. Not only will it cover you in the case something goes wrong, but it also makes you look much more professional to the property owner. Props. Don't be afraid to spend a little time gathering props for your film. If you don't have much money to work with, use the things that you have available to you to further your story. Don't write a story about a horde of zombies if you only have one other actor to work with. Keep it simple if you need to, and write a story that's going to be easy for you to film. You can even film a horror short all by yourself. I've done it myself on occasion. If you do have a little money for your film, get things like fake blood, scars, makeup, and costumes to help sell your story. Also, look up tutorials on how to achieve some DIY special effects using practical makeup, or you can go the After Effects route and try your hand at some CG effects. If you don't feel up to the task, look around in your community for like-minded individuals that may be interested in makeup effects or computer graphics. You may be surprised who has the talent and is willing to be a part of your project just for the fun of it. Not only will you make a better film, but you'll make some awesome friends in the process. Casting. And lastly, if you're going to cast someone to be in your film, make sure they fit the part. Nothing ruins a film more than having a character that just doesn't seem believable. For instance, don't cast your 12-year-old brother in the role of a grizzled old detective that's hunting a serial killer. If you can't find the right actor, consider simplifying your story to work with what and who you have available to you. That way you're using all of your assets appropriately. Okay guys, that's all the tips I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. And if you do happen to go out and this video has inspired you to make a new horror short, please give us a link below so we can all check it out. And also if you have any other tips and tricks for creating horror films, please leave them below for your fellow filmmakers to check out. If you haven't already, please subscribe and click the bell notification icon so you'll know when we post a new video. Please give this video a like so it'll go up in the search rankings. 
I, again, I really appreciate you guys watching and supporting me. The channel is growing. I love you guys. Uh, I love all my fellow filmmakers that help give me insights and tell me that the videos are helping them in some way. It really means the world to me. So once again, thank you so much. Hope you guys have a safe and happy Halloween, and I will see you guys on the next Piedmont Motion Picture Show. And there you have it, guys. Before I go, what sort of topics would you like me to cover in the horror filmmaking genre going forward? You've seen everything that I've done so far. Is there anything that you think I've missed covering here on the channel? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for your support over the years, and thank you so much to my channel members for your continued monthly support. I really appreciate it. October is my favorite time of year to make content for the channel, so be on the lookout for some new stuff coming real soon. I'm very excited about it. Thank you guys for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan, and I will see you on the next video. Bye-bye. October is when my creative juices get to flowing the most, so be on the lookout for some new videos here.